This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 886 of Horse Tip Daily. A different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you, one day at a time. Greetings, horse people. Coach Jen here, and thanks for tuning in to Horse Tip Daily. Today's tip is an excerpt from the Horse.com's weekly horse health report on horses in the morning. The Hit'em crew is joined by the Horse.com digital editor, Christy West, and Bill Glisson from the Hay Exchange with some advice on hay. Good or bad, green or bleached, moldy or not, Bill answers everyone's questions. And we'll get right to our tip after this important message from StatelineTAC.com. When the weather forecast calls for wind, rain, bone-chilling temperatures, or snow, look no further than StatelineTAC.com to make sure your barn time is warm, dry, and stylish. StatelineTAC.com has jackets and vests that keep you warm and dry from afternoon hacks in New England to break-of-dawn schooling sessions in Wellington. They also carry a wide selection of toasty warm breeches for schooling ring or show ring. They even have waterproof breeches for those days when Mother Nature is at her worst. And StatelineTAC.com knows there's nothing more satisfying than having warm, dry feet at the barn. So they have beautiful winter boots for showing, weather-busting paddock boots for on the horse or off, and lots of rubber boots for mucking about. Surf over to StatelineTAC.com today and choose from your favorite brands like Ariat, Debonair, Dublin, Mountain Horse, Carrots, Tough Rider, and many, many more. StatelineTAC.com You guys today are going to talk about picking good hay, and I know you have with you Bill Glesson, who's the owner of the Hay Exchange. So, uh, Christy, why don't you go ahead and introduce uh, Bill, unless I already did. Uh, he did a little bit. Uh, Bill is owner. Bill Glisson is the owner of the Hay Exchange, and talk to us a little bit about some of the different types of hay that are out there. And part of the reason I know that's kind of a basic question, but I know when I grew up, uh, just riding down at the boarding barn down the street, didn't even think about hay. It was it was in the hay barn. We fed it. Didn't really think a lot about different types of hay. So maybe not everybody knows all of what's out there. People in a similar situation. You bet, Christy. Um, there's two types of forages. There's there's grass forages. And there's legume forages, and, and I'll touch on the difference between those two and how they may apply. But there's also, that's probably the greatest impact on on, uh, on feeders is there's local hay and, and our domestic hay, and then there's imported hay. And by using the term import, I don't necessarily mean we bring it in from out of country. However, we could bring it from Canada into the U.S., which is often done. Uh, but it could be that you fact, the, the simple fact that you live in a geographical region that doesn't grow the type of hay that's maybe your personal preference to feed, and so we refer to that as an import. So, um, you know, growing up, I think um, it depends if we grew up in a in a in a show barn or, or or maybe just in a backyard operation. And you know, feeding hay is basically the personal preference of the horse owner. Um, I believe in this fact that you can feed whatever forage you want, but you should consider a consistent supply and, and uh, some, some quality factors about it. Um, but uh, let's talk uh, just a second about grass haze versus legume haze. I think that's good. Christy, for example, in, uh, in, in Texas there, there's a, a lot of Bermuda forages grown. There's a lot of different varieties of Bermuda grass, some standard uh, varieties as well as some new hybrid varieties that's improved digestibility and, and feed value. And then, uh, of course, you've got the most popular uh, grass forage of all is probably Timothy. And there's many more that have been developed since then. You have Timothy, Orchard, Brome, and these varieties of Bermuda, as well as some new hybrid forages that's being tested by universities around the state and the country. And I refer to those grass forages as, as a good fiber forage. 
and the reason for that, grass forages are fiber. There's there's less feed value and a lot of fiber value as opposed to your legumes, which would be your second classifications, which the most popular legume would be, of course, alfalfa. And then you have clover hays. In the south, they've developed a perennial peanut hay. Um, and so there's, there's, there's also a selection of legumes, hay, and I refer to those as the fuel forages, meaning that there's more protein and energy in those forages than the grass. So there's the major differences that even the most novice hey, feeders should i got to ask about that, though. You said peanut hay. Is that really hay from peanuts? Like peanuts? Very good, very good question. You know, for many, many years... Is there peanuts question, on the bottom so you can feed your elephant and your horse at the same time? Or your mini giraffe? Your mini giraffe, exactly. <laughs> good thought. But no, it's not. <laughs> you know, for years they, they've bailed the tops of peanuts and fed them to cows. So it's a real coarse fiber. Uh, but no, I, I'm going to give credit, I believe, to the University of Georgia who's developed a, a, a perennial peanut that's just a derivative of that peanut bush. Uh, and it's a very highly digestible, high-energy, high-protein forage uh, for the sow since they can't produce alfalfa commercially. So it's a real high, high in protein type of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Green as green could be. Does there you color, go. Where does color come into play when you're dealing with hay? There's a horse husband question for you. Um, you know, because I always tried to judge by color, and then Jennifer always got mad at me because I always liked the really bright green ones, and our horse has to wear a muzzle, so I wasn't allowed to feed any of the bright green stuff. Um, so, you know, is color, is that something you really do look at when you're looking at hay? Well, most people do, and, and i got to tell you, we should also understand this, that uh, the Forage represents over 50% of the cost in feeding a horse, but yet it's the only product we buy that does not have a nutritional profile attached to the product itself, like a bag of feed, for example. And so, unfortunately, people are, they buy it based on their perceived value, which a lot of it has to do with color. You know, one, the old adage, the grass is always greener on the other side, has never made anybody any more money than hay dealers because they'll sell green hay for more money than they would hay that's not quite so green. Is it relevant? You bet. In some cases, it's simply a, 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 a it's an outward uh, way of measuring was it harvested and cured properly. But I got to tell you, let's use alfalfa for example. Alfalfa with a little sun bleach can be just as nutritionally prolific as a pea green hay that's perfect in color, but yet could save a feeder or commercial producer forty or fifty dollars a ton. So there's definitely more that we should evaluate a bale of hay than color alone. Okay, so when you've got your hay bale, because I have to feed some alfalfa here. I'm in Phoenix, and, and uh, like you said, uh, it's kind of hard to uh, find any other kind of hay out here. It's very prevalent, but I feed a grass hay, and then I also feed the alfalfa. But I was always concerned about the edge of the alfalfa bale because that's the one, I guess, was turned up to the sun, and when it was stacked, it was on the sunny side. Um, so it's always a completely bleached out part of the hay bale. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when you've got the four sides, one side is always white because it's been seen in the sun, but you're saying that it still could be very nutritional? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, now it obviously depends on how long it may have been exposed to weather elements other than just sun, but it's interesting how you commented that it's almost white. It's so sun bleached. There's a direct relevancy that the lighter the color of the bleach usually is a representative of the higher quality of the hay. But uh, by no means uh, is sun bleach a reflection of the decrease in quality. That's good to know because I was always trying to sort through and not pick those pieces out. <laughs> well, you know, so. and do I, if I heard of that, we deal with it every day. Anybody that's in the hay business deals with it every day. And you know, you know what the fact is? 20% um, of any stack of hay is going to have external bleach just because 90% of the growers do not put their hay in stored in a completely enclosed barn. So even under a shed, it will receive some sun bleach on the sides. Well, there's always those people like your comment, I can't feed that. I must pick it off or, or not choose a bale of hay that has any at all. Those people simply cost charge the hay to go up a little higher because a producer has to sell that pea green hay with no bleach that's in the middle of the stack for more money than the edges. 
Um, ah, so even if, if you want to talk about controlling cost in these economic times, um, and you, you should evaluate that based on your cost per head per day to feed a horse, and you should educate yourself a little bit more about selecting the right hay and understanding how to interpret the quality of hay. And then, you know, I have I have a question too. All right, so I'm coming from the horse husband's point of view here. Who you know, we get two jobs. We get the show, you know, muck stalls and feed. That's what we're allowed to do. Um, so. My question is, when we're feeding, we're always taught to look for mold, and mold is obviously a curse of every every horse person. And but, is there really a good way? You know, I can never tell. It's a, it's a little dusty, so I just call Jennifer over and say, "Is this moldy?" Because I the sniff test never worked for me. So, is there a good way to tell if your hay is mold, really moldy? You know, because sometimes it's just dusty, and it's just hard to tell. Good points, and in. in and yeah, you need to start off by buying your hay from a reputable source. Yeah, but and even reputable second, sources, there can be crappy hay in the middle. You know, no doubt. And, and there's yeah. no there's no no replacing uh, an individual evaluating each flake of hay before they feed them. There's just no no way. You you need to have that last visual inspection. And if your sniffer don't work, because you're exactly right. In that Arizona market, there's a lot of dry days, a lot of windy days, and it'll blow some farm dirt and some dust into the hay mouse. And so the dust that may be in that hay is uh, not mold spore dust, but just dust dust. And so when you flake that bale, shake it. If you get a little dust in there, you should try and smell it and qualify it. And obviously look for the visible signs of mold and non-feeding hay. Well, I really want, you know how the police have the uh, breathalyzer tests? I really yeah. want a little. I really want a little gadget that horse husbands can use. We just stick it in the hay and it says whether it's moldy or not. Well, I, I just think we should work on that. It sounds like a great yeah, project. Yeah, I think you should. I really do. Yeah. I, I would buy one of those. Would you? Like an internal meat thermometer kind of thing. That's where right. you stick it in and it's like... A, <laughs> a meter or something maybe, huh? A meter. That's yes. perfect! Yes. <laughs> Chris, okay, get so on we're that. All the horse can make a fortune. Absolutely. We're all partners well. on this deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a meter. That looks like a miniature giraffe. That's great. <laughs> It's miniature giraffes are real, side. Glenn. <laughs> miniature giraffes are real. Your mold meter is not real. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, ask, ask uh, Bill another question about things that shouldn't be in hay besides mold. And there are a lot of weeds that can get baled into hay that can cause some problems and things like blister beetles. I mean, where can people find out a little and bit snakes. more? What should they really want? We always used to get snakes in our hay. You'd open it up and there'd Ooh, be a dead snake. snake. That was really gross. Tasty. You know, and all those are factors that I don't know how we'll ever get away from because the reality is hay is produced in a field, to, you know, with the help of Mother Nature, and it's not manufactured. And so, yeah, you'll have the occasional uh, wildlife or animal or rodent or something like that build, um, and um, you just you just got to watch for it. It goes back to watching what you're feeding because I don't know any way that we'll ever replace that. So the recommendation would just be to pitch the flakes on either side of whatever dead critter you just found in your hay, right? You know, nothing replaces common sense, and I'd hate to tell somebody to discard the whole bale, uh, but in some cases that may be necessary, right? I mean, if it's a skunk, you probably want to get rid of the whole bale. If it's an eight-inch grass snake, you probably a couple of flakes. All right, that's sure. the best. People on our Facebook page have been posting the best lines of the day. You get the best line of the day. Nothing oh, is that right? Um, nothing replaces common sense. Right there, best <laughs> line of the day. <laughs> and then my, as my mama always said, when she was cooking in the kitchen and she'd see something, she'd go, oh, if in doubt, throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mom's and then there's note, the other one that, and then there's the Mama's other mom's always. That, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I and disagree, and mama's that, always know. <laughs> they do, and mine used to sometimes say that common sense isn't always common. That's true. That becomes more relevant all the time, does it not? <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. Well, is I this also the words.com segment or the, the bad quotes of the day segment? I'm not sure. Uh, it could be both. It could be both. Today it could be both. Next, <laughs> next week we can get into more, more gory things. Well, there you go. Everything you ever wanted to know about hay but were afraid to ask. To listen to more of the Horse.com's tips, just go to Horse Tip Daily and look for the experts drop-down menu on the left. If you loved listening to the Horses in the Morning Gang, putting in their two cents on all things horse, you can tune in every weekday at horsesinthemorning.com 
for fascinating interviews, news stories from around the world, and clever contests. You can have all of your Horse Radio Network shows with you wherever you go with our free app for iPhone and Android. Just go to your app store and look for Horse Radio Network. And don't forget to support our sponsors here on Horse Tip Daily because they make these podcasts possible. Today's podcast has been brought to you through the generous support of StatelineTAC.com. The Horse Radio Network and the Horse Radio Network hosts are not responsible for statements of guests or their opinions. Use your own judgment when listening to the tips provided by the experts on Horse Tip Daily. Oh.